exchange between... Well, our first priority was to preserve the scene of the crime. We needed to protect the forensic material which was inside there, so we had to make sure it was as secure as possible. I always try to uh, keep a distance emotionally from these sort of things, but I must admit that the first thing I thought when I saw the body lying there was that I've got a, a poor old lady who's probably never done anybody any harm in her life. She goes into the toilet and her life ends there. We didn't actually identify the body for about 14 hours. It was then that we discovered she was a, an old age pensioner from Berry. Her name was Shirley Leach. Shirley had lived most of her life in Berry and had two grown up children. She'd been widowed nearly two years ago when her husband died of cancer. Hello, she was a very good neighbour, great neighbour. I often used to say to her, I hope you never removed from here. Because I'd miss you. The garden's nice and tidy. Is it? Oh, yes. You're just a lovely, kind person who would help anyone, you know, if she could. Do you know it's cold out there and I'm going uptown later? Are oh, you? Yeah. Mm. Yes. Going to meet our Darren. Darren was her only grandchild. The two of them had always been close. Darren, it's my favourite. Listen, who's it back again? It's that uh, culture, uh, culture club. No, no, Graham, it's culture beat. Culture beat, that's it. Hey, I'm going to get it. She was a typical grand. She was young for her age. She loved music. She knew more about music than me. She was well up to date with it all. And she loved buying records. She was more like a mother to me. We used to have a laugh together and spend plenty of time together. Um, we could go out and have a good laugh, have a joke. Um, last time I saw her around 6th of January, when we went to visit my mother in hospital, and we decided to go to the pub. Shirley's journey home meant taking two bus rides, and she and Darren decided to warm up with a drink before setting off. Thanks, love. There you go. Well, that's all right. Put it in your pocket. Cheers, Grant. Yeah, she's to look after me. If I was short of money, she used to help me out a bit. <laughs> oh, before I forget, here you are. I've got something for you. With my mum being in hospital, she bought me a few things. It's only milk and lemons. Eve, we'd better drink up if we're going to catch our bus. Mm, it's getting off the line already, isn't it? Is. I could talk to her about anything, any problems that we used to discuss together. We caught the 9 o'clock bus together. I got off at my usual stop. That was the last time I saw my girl. Shirley's bus carried on towards the interchange. Around the same time, a local man, Gary O'Neill, was arriving at the interchange. I was just on my way home from work and I was just walking through the bus station towards the gents' toilets and I saw a man standing outside. It was quite unusual for anyone to be stood there at that time of night. He was late 40s, early 50s. He was wearing either a grey or beige um, raincoat and a cap, and he had a green bag on his shoulder. As I left, he just faced the bus station. It was about 10 past nine when Shirley got to the interchange. The connecting bus she'd intended to catch home had just gone. Two of the hospital cleaners recognised her at the bus stop. Uh, we missed the bus. Yeah. We're always missing it. All times out of five. What time's next? It'll we'll have to be the uh, 25 to 10 now, won't it? Oh, that's another half hour. Mm. Hey, let's go and have a look at the monitor timetable, see what time that goes. Shirley was obviously annoyed at missing the bus. And a few minutes later, I saw her crossing the interchange wondered where she was going and then I assumed she was going to the tower and that's the last time we saw Shirley. About 15 minutes later, some teenagers were chatting nearby. <laughs> the scream came from the direction of the toilets. What was that? Probably someone messing about or something. <laughs> At around the same time, these two sisters were on their way home after a game of bingo. We'd have caught that. Told you we shouldn't have played that last game. How am I going to get home now? Me and Joan were talking. She were worried she'd missed the bus. And I happened to glance to the 
ladies toilets the alley's back to me the old time they were around five foot six to five foot nine they went out of my view then police believe it was around this time that shirley leach was murdered No one seems to have seen the man leave the interchange. We're obviously looking for somebody who is mentally disturbed. He needs to be caught very quickly. He needs medical help. The particular worry we have is that this was a, a horrendous crime to commit. She was butchered. She was sexually assaulted. And I just thought, what's the world coming to? Well, Mr Maskew, that was such a tragic case. Shirley used to make that journey every night for two weeks to visit her daughter in hospital, and that was the first time she'd ever missed her connecting bus. That's right. It was the first time she'd ever missed a bus. But even if it had happened on other occasions, quite often she'd been accompanied by other members of the family when she'd made that journey. So if that had happened on other nights, it would not have made any difference. But it was the first time she was on her own as well. Indeed, yes. What sort of person do you think could have done this? Clearly a very dangerous individual. If anything, Shirley was a little bit more timid than the actress portrays it in the reconstruction and certainly she was smaller in build. She was clearly a vulnerable victim who I think was selected for that particular purpose. Three people altogether have described the man we saw there in the film loitering at the very interchange. Do you think all those three people actually are describing the same man? Certainly the descriptions are very similar, the one exception being about the top coat that uh, he's seen when he's first seen outside the gents' toilets. That anorak with the drawstring is not visible on the other two sightings. But nevertheless, the remaining description is so similar that I think it could well be the, main, the same man. Although obviously I can't exclude the possibility there may be more than one. Mm. The last sighting, in terms of time, was at about ten past ten that Thursday night, wasn't it? That's right, that's at ten past ten, and it's a young girl who's waiting at a bus queue when she sees the man walking across the interchange. And he is, in fact, leaving the interchange at that point onto Angulum Way. He's holding to his face a white tissue or a white handkerchief, which is bloodstained, and he could well have been bleeding from the face. What precisely is the description you have now of this man? It's a compilation from the three witnesses. And he's aged between 40 and 50 years of age, 5 feet 7 to 5, eight in, 5 feet 8 inches tall. And certainly on the night of the murder, he was wearing a sports coat or suit type jacket, a flat cap, or as a hairstyle which creates that impression. Any indication at all for you where he might have come from? Now that's a difficult one. It's, it's a busy bus station where the incident occurred and it's also the Metrolink for the tram services in Manchester. He could in fact have come from anywhere in the country. How are you hoping that viewers tonight might be able to help? Hoping by someone may recognise the man from the description and the reconstruction. It may be someone they know, particularly females. It may be someone that they feel uncomfortable in his presence. He meets the criteria in terms of age and height. And it may be some other thing that uh, means that they're connecting with this incident. And if that's the case, I would ask that they please contact. And, of course, anybody else who may have seen the man answering that description on that night. Anyone else with any information whatsoever. It's such a dreadful crime as this that I really do appeal to people people if they've got any information to make contact with me. Mr Maskery, thank you very much. And just to remind you, we're talking about the evening of Thursday the 6th of January at the Berry Interchange bus um, terminal. If you can help, please call us here in the studio. This is the number here, 0500 600 600, or you can ring the incident room direct, and that number is 061 856 8383. That's 061 for Manchester, 856 8383. It seemed like the phones were fairly slow when we started this evening, but now things have really speeded up, and the best information seems to be coming so far on the first reconstruction, the murder of Derek Kiley. We've had t two people give the same name as possible. I've just heard it's now three people have given the same name. There's also uh, another potential witness. Somebody has rung in with the name of somebody who is known to have had an argument with Dell, who was seen on the Tuesday morning, the morning after uh, the murder covered in blood, so we'll bring you more of that as soon as we get more information on it. There's quite a lot of stuff coming in from Photocall as well. Anyway, finally this evening, we see the return of Aladdin's Cave, our collection of cherished possessions, some of which might just be yours. Tonight's haul has been recovered by the Metropolitan Police through a crackdown on burglaries called Operation Bumblebee. Here to take us through it, Eric Knowles. Thank you, Nick. Lots of wonderful things in the cave this evening. For starters, feast your eye on this old boy straight out of a Thomas Hardy novel. There he is in his Sunday smock, brushing up his top hat just before he makes his way to church. Good artist, I'm not going to tell you who it is, you tell me, but feast your eyes on this wonderful mirror, Regency mirror, gilt wood, you can see it's got everything, the eagle on the top,